Just give a few people a few minutes to jump on here. Here I am live again. I've really been enjoying these go lives and it looks like I've got a plant growing out of my head, but I don't. It's part of the decorations, but I've also got Bubba here with me again today. She goes in for a haircut tomorrow. She's going to get the lion cut. So she's going to turn into a little skinny lion. She's going to be so cute, but she just get a haircut under sedation. <laughs> twice a year because it's like whenever whenever we try to give her, if I try to do it it's like I am trying to murder her so I we take her in to get it cut uh today I'm very excited we're going to do a journal club I am doing a journal out of Anna the nephrology nursing journal and I kind of went through um I debated between the water treatment and the venous needle dislodgement. I ended up going with, we're going to, I'm going to talk about the venous needle dislodgement and excess bloodline separation because water is kind of boring. And I thought that I knew everything there was to know about venous needle dislodgement. So I thought that this article was going to be boring and it turns out that it was very interesting and eye opening. Um, I'll see what I can do. I'll post a link in my description page and maybe in the future I'll try to do like a monthly journal club so you guys are kind of aware of it and I'll post that to the Facebook group and I'll post a link to the Facebook group down below. Um, I'm just going to read the first sentence and then I'll kind of give my take on it. If you have any questions, jump in. Thoughts. I love everybody's thoughts and experiences with venous dislodgement because I will tell you the longer I do dialysis the more anxiety I have about um, venous dislodgement and excess bloodline separation so um, I think one of I there was a similar article to this I think I read maybe a year or two ago and it only talked about venous dislodgement and so I'm kind of I'm very excited <laughs> I am excited. I'm excited that they added excess bloodline separation because that I have heard of that happening and it is an awful thing to happen to the patient and it's it's scary for everyone. So I just kind of want to be prepared. Um, they call it VND and ABLS. The issue of blood loss during hemodialysis is due to venous needle dislodgement and excess bloodline separation. It is a serious, potentially life-threatening and underreported treatment complication. Um, and just for all, and this is, where do I start? So I'll, I'll, we all know, or we're familiar that there is a lot of blood going through that line at a time, 300, 300 to 500 mils per minute. And in here, it kind of mentions the average adult has a total volume of about five liters. So, you know, it doesn't take long for them to vet, develop hemorrhagic shock from blood loss. Hey, we're talking venous dislodgement. Um, where else? So I think we can all, I think one of the challenges I have in my own practice is you teach them, especially if they're an established patient and trying to re-educate them to keep their access uncovered, their, whether it's their catheter or their fistula is tough. So I, one of my my own personal practice is when they start, whether it's with a catheter or with a fistula, I, we tell them that it has to be uncovered. We have to be able to see it because they could lose a lot of blood before we even notice it. And they could, and you know, they'll be like, well, I'll feel it. I could be sleeping, but no, they, it is, it happens too quickly. And so Risk characteristics and prevention. I really like this table on here. Risk factors associated with these things happening. Just the other day, we had a new patient that was confused and we kept an eye on him and he had a new fistula and for he had his arm like on his chest because he was cold and I went to kind of bring his arm so I could see it and I swear the needle was halfway out and the tape was off and that machine was not alarming. By the grace of God, he did not have a large infiltrate, but it really put me in check. I'm just like, oh my God, we, this almost happened. This could have been detrimental. And one of my, um, you know, as a, as a Working in dialysis, sometimes I feel like we trust the machine too much where we're like, well, if the needle comes out or if anything happens, the machine's going to alarm. And what I really like 
about this article. It talks about how the, the dialysis machine is not as smart as we think and that the risk of, where is it? Securing bloodlines, practice recommendations, clothing, plastic cannulas. Well, I guess I'll go back to that topic. Oh, assessment. It was really good. Maybe I'm too far. Oh, here it says staff and patients cannot re rely on hemodialysis machine alarms to alert them to these complications due to the small pressure changes associated with venous needle dislodgement and the separation of the lines. And that that is so true. When, when I heard of this happening with a dialysis patient, whether it was an infiltrate or the thing came undetected, they always say, but the machine didn't alarm. Why didn't the machine alarm? And it mentions that based on the ranges that it's sometimes the pressure change just isn't enough. And it says, however, patient movement, height changes, needle cannulation size, blood flow rates, the type of access, the flow resistance, and vis viscosity affect static pressures. Um, I know whenever I help somebody stand up to use the urinal, I notice that there are pressure changes and the machine doesn't always alarm. And it's, there's significant pressure changes and I kind of have to make changes. Um, especially with fistulas. 30%. Had an intra access pressure high enough to trigger a low venous pressure alarm. So only like only 30%, whenever it became dislodged, did the machine alarm. That's not very, not very much. So I, I think that is something that I'll bring into my practice and educating new staff. I think maybe I'll bring it up and huddle like, hey, I read this super interesting, fun article. And it mentioned that we cannot rely on our machines to tell us when something is wrong with their access. Um, what else? That was that was like my number one takeaway from this um, from this article. And then I really like to talk a lot about taping technique, and I think that's something that we give a lot of um, autonomy to towards our staff. How how it it's kind of like usually what I say is it doesn't matter how you tape it, just make sure it stays. And I think I'll probably bring this to my clinic, but it has this. Uh, visual of different ways to tape the 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 needles in place and I really liked it I, I think my favorite one is the H method so I think I might kind of start doing the H method where they'll where the they'll tape the wings down and then tape alongside and the other thing it kind of mentions that I I don't do, I'll admit in my own practice is whenever you take the tape off, you should replace it with new tape that is extra sticky. Uh, they say that that is also a risk factor on taping and retaping increases the risk of the tape coming off. Um, they use chevrons a lot here. I'm gonna tell you that if you work with me, you know that I'm not a fan of a super tight um, wrapped around chevron, but maybe once it is established that the needle is working and the needle is in, in a good place, that would be a good time to chevron. It's just when they chevron, when we chevron it right away, and then we need to change or reposition the needle. And then I just can't get in there. And then I'm like scared of infiltrate and it takes so much time, but, uh, a chevron done well at the appropriate time definitely works. It keeps it keeps those needles in here. Uh, every month we do an education topic, and this is I think a good visual for uh, patients, especially any that do not speak English. And if you're in an English speaking facility, just because it just really shows that if their face is uncovered, I just I've had so much experiences now where. If someone's face is uncovered or like sometimes I'm just like there's one day where I was just like anxiety about everything and I'm just like are you okay are you okay and finally one of the patients is like Lindsay are you okay I'm like yeah and just like I'm really keeping an eye on you guys today I really want to make sure everyone is safe um and then also I think sometimes patients talk about you know I'll feel it. If there's the visual alarm where if you're covered up with blankets and this is, I've heard of this happening too, where they're covered up in blankets and then you lift up the blanket and then there's just blood and you, there was no blood on top. And whether it was a big bleed or a small bleed, it's 
keep that fistula uncovered. And the other advice I can give is, you know, patients have the right to refuse. They're just like, I'm cold. I'm going to keep it uncovered. I feel safe. And I would just give them this visual. I will educate them. And then I will document that. And sometimes everything is fine until it's not fine. Like, oh, I didn't educate them today on them keeping their access uncovered. And this has been, you know, this is standard to get used to it and it's going on for months. And then something bad happens or the state comes and they, they want to see your documentation. So everything is fine until it's not fine. So just pretend that everything is not fine and you want to cover your bases and prove that you taught the patient and the patient understood the risks of keeping, of not keeping your, keeping your needle uncovered because it's just, I think this, there was somewhere in this article, it talked about how there was something like this happened in California and the patient died. This characteristics. Oh, so alarm fatigue. Oh, that's something else too. Cause a lot of the literature view, it talked about when these things happened that especially in the Sentinel event in California, it said alarm fatigue, which is a syndrome of overriding the alarm without a thorough assessment of the cause of the alarm also increases the risk. I mean, come on, we all, know about alarm fatigue as healthcare workers. It is exhausting and um, in, di in dialysis, in dialysis and alarm fatigue, patient safety tip of the week, the authors described a situation in California in which a patient with a femoral CVC experienced a disconnection between the CVC and the venous bloodline. Reviews of this event indicated that several alarms were silenced as well as blood loss being unobserved to, due to a blanket placed over the access site. In 2018, the Joint Commission issued a Sentinel event alert, medical device alarm safety in hospitals, detailing issues with medical device alarm safety in hospitals. The Joint Commission in 2021 make improvements to ensure that alarms on medical equipment are heard and responded to on time. Oh, the other thing which I don't really have, I haven't seen in my current practice, but I definitely wanna hear from you guys if you guys have the safety devices. Uh, that detect blood or detect wetness. Let's see. What are they called? There is the Fresenius 2008K at home machine wet alert. It's a wireless device and is approved by the FDA, cleared for sales in the United States. It indication for useless so optional disposable accessory to aid in detection of blood or water leaks during hemodialysis. This, I think, just reading that Sentinel event would be definitely be great for anybody with a, uh, oh, hey, thank you so much. You are welcome. I'm so happy you're here. Yeah, so, oh, these these safety alerts, I'm, I'm curious how much they cost. I If they're just a one-time use, that kind of sucks unless they're super cheap, but I think that this would be a great resource for anyone with a, any kind of femoral line, whether it's a fistula graft or central line. And then I really like this risk factors associated with venous needle dislodgement because it talks about altered mental status. And that is definitely one of the key factors to these things happening. I, some of our older patients that are confused, I will tell them every day and I, and I don't, so I'm like, keep this uncovered. I have to see this. And then I'll come back 15 minutes later and it'll be uncovered and I'll do it all over again. And they just, they just don't remember. Or they don't understand or, you know, their hand gets cold. That fictional hand gets really cold. Um, so I think that's definitely, and it also talks about treatment complications with hypotensional muscle cramps and diaphoresis when people have intradialytic symptoms. I find that really interesting because, you know, sometimes when those people cramp, they cramp hard and they practically jump out of their chair and they, they're not paying attention to their lines. They just know that they are in pain and they've got to relieve it however they can. So I think people that are at high risk that have we've been struggling, they've been having experiencing a lot of muscle cramps. So we've been trying to help with their fluid gains. Patients who refuse to keep access and bloodlines uncovered. We've all experienced this. Oh, that reminds me, um, a lot of my staff, you know, we are, we're all dealing with COVID and our clinic does inpatient and outpatient. And we've been caring for people with COVID and practice during the COVID-19 pandemic has made 
the following guidelines a challenge. So what were the guidelines? Let me see. So some of the guidelines is you should always be able to see that access when you're in the acute setting. And, you know, sometimes you have these temporary lines. Um, there's a lot of femoral lines there. And it talks about practice during the COVID-19 pandemic has made following the guidelines a challenge. Suggested nursing staff caring for patients in critical care units who are COVID-19 positive observe the patient from far enough through a glass partition to protect staff. So the, the guideline is if you're caring for COVID patients, and this is just inpatient nursing, not necessarily dialysis, is that you don't spend a lot of time in that room. You can, and you know, our unit has made the glass doors so you can see them and the IV poles are outside. But when you're in dialysis, you have your machine in there. And then it also talks about um, the CDC and CMS, the CDC and CMS has not specifically addressed how the nurse can visualize the access while distancing from the patient receiving hemodialysis who is COVID-19 positive. The literature review did not find information related to related to patient proning leading to an increase in venous needle dislodgement. It I we've been in the more you work in inpatient dialysis and now with the COVID surge again, a lot of our patients are prone and it is hard. <laughs> we've <laughs> I just remember just going in there, trying to find the line and then, you know, moving their neck and then getting it hooked up and then reaching it to the machine and everything's packed. You're wearing all of this PPE and you, if it's not on the side of the door, you cannot see that needle. And it is a very stressful situation because you have to be in there for three hours and you're all messed up. You don't get a lot of breaks in there. So I am curious as to what kind of information will come out with that and maybe one of the um, solutions to this is for our COVID patients having a device that detects blood loss. Um, wow, I think that's a great idea. I think maybe we'll bring it to collaborative practice if that's something that we can get for some of our COVID patients uh, to help our nursing staff stay outside of the, the room and stay safe that way. Let's see, how long have I been talking? What do you guys have to say? What have your guys' experiences been with venous needle dislodgement? And I will say, I'm, I'm not sure if I said this already, a lot of our infiltrates, they they don't get machine alarms either. You're just some people will be like, oh, it infiltrated. I feel so bad. I'm so sorry. The machine didn't alarm. And a lot of times that infiltrate is just enough there's enough pressure that it, it, the machine won't alarm or if the needle comes out and it's against the pillow, it's still going to feel resistance on the pillow and that machine will not alarm. So I'm kind of getting myself, uh, oh, thank you so, ma so much. Do you go by Mel, Melly? Melly Vigiana. Melly. Let me know. Um, yeah, I am. I'll kind of bring this back to my clinic and see see if this is an option for us. Let's see. I don't know if anybody uses plastic ABF cannulation devices. We definitely don't. Let's see. Ooh, clothing to enhance direct observation of connections. We did have a few patients that came in with specialty clothes. And I can't remember if I had a dream about this last night that somebody had one of these clothing or if it was, I just read this before I went to bed last night. And I think there was a website that was posted in here too about where we can get some things. Uh, it also, what's this one? Assessment of the risk for a serious venous needle dislodgement incident. So it kind of comes up with a score. Not that we need to, if um, this might be a good idea, might bring this to, it kind of talks about the different risk factors and who is at high, high risk for this happening. Melissa, thank you, Melissa. All right. Oh, here it is. So here's, and it also gives you, and these are great resources for patients too. I think that this, is something that um, we do monthly education and whenever we talk about venous dislodgement again, that we can give them some of these resources. And I have to stress enough, the patients who start at dialysis and you educate them early, they are some of the easiest. We never have issues with them keeping their fistula uncovered. It's when we have our confused patients 
maybe we didn't do education with them at the start. And now they're just like, why now? Uh, we kind of ran into that problem at our clinic when we're like, we need to really push um, to have their access uncovered and their face uncovered and, you know, education, document, education, document. And it is so important to document because if anything happens, it might not come back to you for, you know, with how slow the system is, it might not come back to you in three and four years and then you won't remember. And then the only thing you can say is if whatever I charted is what happened, whatever I documented is what happened. So if you documented that you, taught them, they understood, and yet they refused, that kind of uh, removes your liability from the situation. Hmm. This is a pretty cool visual too. So, I mean, I, I had low expectations for this article, but I really learned a lot from it. Um, so I guess this is 1.4 contact hours which I need some for my CDN to keep that up to date. The only thing that when I first joined Anna, there was, you could get free. Oh, and the other thing that they did is they changed the name from CNE contact hours to NCPD. So nursing continuing professional development instead of contact hours. So I guess that's it, but it costs $15 for these contact hours. And when I first started, they, I would get some for free, but I guess I just kind of have to accept that. <sighs> hey, Heidi. Oh, thank you so much. Have you, what, what, what do you guys do at your clinic to keep everyone's fistula uncovered? Come here, Bubba. Come here. Say hi. Say hi, Bubba. Oh, she likes to be pet with with my eyes. She's not really a very cuddly cat. So it goes. Mm -hmm. What else is going on? How are the clinics going? How, how's the dialysis learning going? Bubba. Otherwise, that kind of sums it up. Oh, we let them know it's in the policy. That's good too, because sometimes I think that they just want a little bit of leeway on things where they're just like, no, Lindsay, it's okay. Just I'll be fine. I'll be fine. And then when you're like, it's, it's not in my control. Like this is part of the policy. This is part of our standards of care. Like our hands are tied. Then they're going to be like, okay, okay. And yeah, I, I like that way of doing things sometimes when especially when sometimes things don't make sense. This makes sense. Um, yeah, it, it is. Visuals help too. Otherwise, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm kind of excited for the leakish devices for our, our COVID patients. So I think so it's the end of September. I think next month I'll, are, are you guys members? Are you guys on Facebook? Are you guys in the Facebook group? I'll um, post a link to that. There's just so much support in there. I swear if I, when I first, I almost, I, hi, I started this. I'm just so grateful for all of you guys. I couldn't, I couldn't do this without you. I have I'm almost to a thousand subscribers, which I remember when I got my first 50, I just thought that was a miracle in itself. And I just love how niche dialysis is. I love how supportive everybody is. And everybody, everybody was a new dialysis nurse at one point, and we've all been in your shoes. And uh, in the Facebook group, people ask about different like contract rates, um, different other questions that happen to them at dialysis. And it's just kind of, it's kind of like a group therapy work. Like this is what's going to have any, it, we all, we all share our experiences of strength and hope and you know what it used to be like and what it's like now and how things have gotten better. Oh, go. Yeah. I'm so excited. I just, I'm so grateful to all of you guys. I, I love, I love your guys' support of me and jumping on this Facebook live group. I just, Oh, I'm not on Facebook. You guys know what I mean. I can't get all the words right all the time. But um, it's it's just better than I ever imagined. I One of uh, the members, Paulo, mentioned 
um, doing like a CDN review course. And I think that even maybe making a subgroup within the Facebook group where people can, that are studying for the C CDN can kind of get together and share their experiences and what they're studying and what, what's helped them. So maybe I'll, I'll work on that this week. But with that, I think I'm going to work on my next Facebook video. I, not my Facebook, my YouTube video. I started it yesterday and I did a TikTok on it, which is just kind of short and sweet for non-dialysis nurses. And then I'm just going to do a deep dive into it. Um, the different type of dialysis patients that we see and the differences between ESRD and AKI and how different our practice is. Because um, when I first started, all of our AKIs were done at the hospital, but now all of our AKIs are at the clinic, which which I'm grateful for because the, the, the hospital gets busy and um, it, and AKI patients are generally, they're, they're, they're a stable bunch. And it's, it's so exciting when they come in and their weight drops and their kidneys start waking up and you get to give them that good news uh, that happened to me the other day where we got their labs back. And I'm just like, I'm so excited to tell you this. I just can't wait. And yeah, oh, dialysis, I just can't get enough. All right. Thank you, Heidi and Melissa. I appreciate you guys jumping on and um, I'll see you guys on the Facebook group. Take care.